When the Tre Trinity River overflowed in 1920, it was really a catastrophe for that part of Fort Worth in which I was stationed for about, oh, a mile from the river, which was, came very near to the schoolhouse. There was water deep enough to row a boat, and ever so many people were drowned out of their homes. They used the school for a place to take care of these people. My room was used for clothing. They were fed in our cafeteria, and they slept on mattresses in our halls and just whichever, whenever place they could find to put them. Now, Jane Turner, who was my chum at this new school, had some friends living on the north side, and we went to their homes to stay. Had it not been for that, I don't know what we'd have done because we had no way of getting back to town and there wasn't any place uh, out there that, in any sort of a hotel. And our patrons, if they had uh, been able to stay at home, were not the kind of people who were able to entertain company, but fortunately we had a place to stay for two nights and then we could go home. We managed to get to the station. The Fort Worth and Denver train stopped about six miles out from the uptown depot at the stockyard station, and that way we could get a ride home. Well, at uh, my boarding house, First year I was here, there was a man who had just come to Fort Worth. He didn't know anybody. And uh, he had a real nice Hudson car, so that he, I got acquainted with him, and that made it nice for me. I uh, got to go around quite a bit. And I didn't go back to that school at the end of the year because I did not know how to handle Mexican children too well, and I didn't want to teach the first grade. So I asked for a transfer, and I went to Sam Rosen School. It was about four miles from the uh, MGL School where I started, and it was in a better part of town. They were old middle-class people that were in comfortable circumstances. And I didn't have the foreign children, but the best thing, the real reason I asked for a transfer was because I didn't want to teach first grade, and I got the second grade in Sam Rosen School. But I didn't get to teach in the schoolhouse the first year I was there. They were overcrowded, and I was a new teacher, so if anybody's put out where I was, the principal told me that he was going to put me in the church house to teach because I could handle my children and I wouldn't, he wasn't afraid to put me out there by myself and he put a teacher of larger children why it might be better for him to be close to them. I think that was an excuse, but anyway, I had rather an unusual experience teaching a block from the school and it was unusual in more ways than one. It was just a makeshift room. The church wasn't complete. There was nothing there but just the basement and nobody there but me and my children. And there were five days in the term that I was there that I did not get into my room at all because the basement was flooded. I had one pupil who was a really and truly an idiot. I'm not exaggerating at all. That's all he was, just an idiot. And we had some extra room, so I gave him a pair of scissors and a catalog to go up and that way I could put him off by himself and keep him entertained. He left our school and when he came back I told the principal I just could not handle him. So he called the superintendent and said I couldn't handle this boy. He'd just sing out in the middle of what we were doing and I just couldn't do anything with him at all. The principal, Mr. Reed, and Mr. Moore, the superintendent, asked him, well, why couldn't I handle him? Why didn't I make him behave? And Mr. Reed said, well, she can't. He said, if anybody could, she could, but it just can't be done. So they sent him to a special room. They did have a special room at that time. 
and they kept him five days and sent him to Austin to the editor's column. And I opened my eyes. I said, if I never had to, if I ever had to have a case like that again, I wouldn't wait a long time. I'd know what to do about it. One time they had a funeral in the church, and I had to keep my children at a death-like silence because the walls weren't very thin. And they started singing at the funeral, and I thought that I had gone slap that crazy when I heard what they were singing. I thought that could not be. So I said, children, do you know what that song is? They said, yes, ma'am. That's my Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Well, that's what I thought it was. I found out while they were singing it, that this little funeral was a, that of a little 12-year-old boy who had incident, accidentally shot himself. And My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean was one of his favorite songs. So that's why they were singing it. The summer that um, I went home after that term, I went to the, the I, well, I had a nice summer. Then when I came back, I moved to the YWCA to live. I had not stayed in the same place that I started the first year I was in Fort Worth. It was a private home and I just didn't like to stay there. So I got a room with a little sitting room and a private bath closer in and I paid $35 a month for it and that seemed a terrible rate for anybody to pay. In that day, I was getting $133 a month for 12 months, making $1,200 a year. And it seemed to me that I could never spend all that money because I had just got $83 a month in Corona. The YWCA was a very nice place to live. It was a, a fine place. It was so fine, we couldn't stay there. Very, I did live there for four years. Then. All of us who were making a living salary had to move because it was not built for that place of girls. It was built for women that really f needed financial help, so that excluded us. But it was close to town, and we could uh, go up there at night and run the shop. It wasn't dangerous to get out at night in those days. Part of the time, they served meals, and part of the time, we ate up town. And that was interesting, too. I was getting to go around quite a bit in Fort Worth that day. One of the friends at the Sam Rosen School, Jesse Lloyd, who still lives next door to me in this apartment house now, had a car, and I didn't. And she took me to Dallas to the shows and around quite a bit. Then there was a Inez Franklin, who lived at the YWCA who had a fine big car and she took the, the some of us out quite a bit. And that was the year that David and Manabel married. They married in the spring. I was getting ready to go. Mom and I were going with the El Paso Shriners to Washington, D.C. to their uh, national meeting. Fort Worth was not sending the train, so the Fort Worth Shriners and their families were going on the El Paso train. It was a wonderful trip, but just before I went, I had this letter from David, and he said, uh, Dear sister, I'm bringing the girl I'm going to marry down to Fort Worth to see you on the 23rd of May. And if you don't like her, I'm going to whip you both. I think he had known her three weeks. He always claimed he'd known her, known her six weeks, but I believe he was not telling the truth. I think it was really just three weeks. I was so tired I was nearly dead the day they came. I, it was the day that we had to make our final report at school, and that's a very trying thing. But of course, I went to the wedding. Mama was with them. They had started to Paris for the wedding. That was uh, her home. But they decided they got married when they got to Fort Worth. 
was so tired and late as I was, I had to dress. And Mom and I went with them to the First Christian Church, and they got married. I was rushing around to get off on this trip with the Shriners. Mom was going to go, too. I hardly had time to think about the bride and groom, but I got off on the trip all right. Uh, the train, of course, was a special train, and the first stop was New Orleans. They took us over the city for a nice ride and had dinner for us at the Roosevelt Hotel, which was in the best, then the best. And when we had a dance, we stopped in uh, Meridian, Mississippi, and they had breakfast for us there and took us a ride over the city. And something I laughed about quite a bit. One thing they showed us was the insane asylum. We just drove by it because it was pretty built and had pretty greens grounds. There's a woman sitting there in a chair just rocking and rocking and rocking out in the yard where we could see her. And Mama said, I'll never rock again. <laughs> and she didn't. She used to like to sit on porch and rock, but she'd always think of that crazy woman and she wouldn't do it anymore. Now, in North Carolina, at Gastonia, we got off the train and cars met us and took us to Charlotte so we could have a, a nice ride and see the North Carolina countryside, which was very beautiful. In Charlotte, we were dined and entertained again, and then we got to Washington. And of course, that was a gay time. And when the meeting was over, Mom and I went on to New York. We stayed in New York two days. Well, if you've never been to New York, <laughs> you can see an awful lot in two days. We went uptown one day and downtown the other day and went out to the Statue of Liberty and we went to, to, to the Batter Inn. We went most every other place you hear people going there, but it sure did make a busy trip for us. From New York, we went to Montreal. Thelma Carlson, who was the daughter of Mama's girlhood friend for whom I was named, was a news report, paper reporter in uh, Montreal. She got us passage to the shows, and of course we had the regular rides over the city, and I saw the St. Lawrence River. And at night we went to shows, and one of them was one of the most popular shows that ever has been in the United States. That was Abe's Irish Rose. We went back to Niagara Falls, and the whole trip was very delightful. We hadn't been home too long, so we went to another wedding. That was Frank's. Frank married a girl that I had known all her life. Lorraine Griffiths was her name. But uh, she was younger than I, and of course, not going in the same crowd, I really didn't know her. Except I knew enough, well enough to say hello to her, and I knew her family and her background. Very lovely girl. And uh, going back to David's wedding, Annabelle May, the girl he married from Paris, was a lovely girl too. She had uh, come to Quanta to work in the hospital. She was studying to be a nurse, but when she met David and they got married, well, that was the end of it. Frank and Lorraine had a pretty little home wedding, and Lorraine forgot to wear her flowers. They went to um, California uh, for their honeymoon. And the, the next year, David Paxton Smith was born. He was Manabelle and David's son. He was their first grandson. I say our first grandson. He was the first grandson. And of course, he was a very wonderful baby, but he was a sick child. His, they had a hard time getting him started. And they almost didn't get to keep him. But uh, David and Manabelle went down to, to Paris to see her family, and they stopped in Fort Worth and took their baby to Dr. Godley, and he got him straightened out, and he got along just fine. 
He didn't have any more trouble until he was grown. I had my second trip to New York while I was living at the YW. Bertha St. John and Lucille Ball and I went on this trip. We went to uh, Washington by boat from uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and that was quite an interesting experience because uh, boat trips are always that way. The Chesapeake Bay was very, very calm. It was a much nicer trip than I had on the Pacific Ocean on, when I came from Portland down to California. At Norfolk, uh, they were, it seemed to me like about a thousand little nigger boys screaming and yelling to carry our bags when we were there. And it was pitiful because they were, because they were so ragged. On this boat to Washington, there was a very nice man, and he asked us where we were going to stay, and we told him we'd select one of the good hotels, and he said, I wouldn't go there for you. I'd go to Everett. He said, it won't cost you near as much. It's a small, little old hotel, but it's a nice place, and you'll like it. And he said, tomorrow, my wife and I will come and take you over the city. Well, we went to the Everett, and it was nice. It was well located, easy for us to find the places we intended to go. But the man and his wife never did show up. We saw Washington without any help, though, because we could get around. And I think we saw everything there was to see there. We stayed long enough to really see it. Then we went to New York, and we stayed there 10 days. We went there to every place you hear about people going including Coney Island. We went out to Coney Island one Sunday on a boat, and it was a man on that boat that got friendly with us. He told us that he'd take us through the stock exchange. Well, of course, now anybody can go to the stock exchange, but then you couldn't. You had to be introduced by a member, accompanied by a member. This, this Mr. Butterfield, was, I guess that was his name, that's what he said it was. He said his wife and his daughter were in Europe. Anyway, he couldn't take us to the stock exchange, but he got a friend who belonged to take us, and we got to go through the stock exchange. I had a friend in New York at the time who was dietitian for Texas Tech at Lubbock. I met her there, and I told her, about this man, and I told her that he called after the next morning after we had seen him at Coney Island, and he said that he had two friends that would like to come with us, and they would like to take us to Greenwich Village. Well, we didn't want to be coupled off like that, so we just told him we wouldn't go, and she said, well, it might have been all right, it just might have been so expensive that he couldn't afford to take us, all three of us, he wanted somebody to help him, but Anyway, we didn't get mixed up with them. Then we went to Montreal, and so he did. And I got mad when I think about this. For $8 extra, we could have gone through the Thousand Islands, but Lucille Bone didn't want to spend that money, so she wouldn't spend the $32. And I sometimes wish I'd offered the board for a ticket because I would have got to see the Thousand Islands. I haven't been there yet. In Quebec, we were going to stay at Chateau Frontenac. That was the best hotel. That's where we were going. So we went, and we got there. They wouldn't even look at us. They had, to, had a reservation a long time for then. But we stayed there until we found where to go, and they didn't offer us any help or whatever. I asked for my mail, and the girl said, what Smith did you say? And I told her, Alice, again, she said, well, we know, you know, we have a great deal of Smiths up here. As I said, the old hotel did not offer to do anything for us, help us get located. But a bellhop noticed our predicament, and he came up to us, and he said, I'll tell you what to do. 
and he told us where to go. It was a travel bureau, and he said, uh, they'll find you a place. Well, they took us to a private home, and I am sure that it was nice, but it was just a different thing we'd ever seen that we couldn't feel too safe there. It, I think the house had six rooms, and I think they had two rooms on each floor. Anyway, it was a very small house, but it was three stories high. We were in Quebec three days, and we stayed at three hotels. We found another one the next day, and we said, no, that isn't right. We moved to another private home the next day, but we didn't like it either. We didn't fit on there. And the third day, we got in at the Lorraine Hotel, which was uh, not what we'd planned on, but it was all right. From, uh, we, we went out to St. Anne de Beaupre there, the shrine out from uh, Quebec, and we went all over Quebec. I was much amused at a little uh, paper boy. He said, um, buy a paper? And I said, no, I don't want a paper. He said, well, it's a good paper, it's English. Of course, there was so much fresh in Quebec that we had trouble in the stores, but uh, there used to be a floor walker, somebody come up and interpret for us. One thing we liked about Quebec, especially besides the scenery and the novelty, was the food. It was extra good. We went from there to Niagara Falls, and then to Chicago, and on home. Somewhere along the line, I had another trip that was such a disappointment, I almost forgot all about it. Darks. I had some friends that had been to uh, Eureka Springs one summer, and they told such glowing accounts of the beautiful country and the good town, I could hardly wait to get there. So uh, I didn't go when I planned because I had a spider bite. Lenabelle and David had bought a little home, and in the yard, as in so most of the yards in Bonnet that day, there was a dugout, cellar, or storm house, whatever you might call it. And Menabelle kept her magazines down there. And I wanted something that they had that I wanted to read something that was down there. So I went down to look through the things. And I felt, uh, well, it felt like a pin or a needle sticking my leg. And I slept my a leg at that place, and then I pulled my stocking down to see if I found anything, and it was the spider. And when I got home, I told my mom about it, and she asked me, what kind of a spider? And I said, oh, I, I guess it was, just, it was so mashed up, I really couldn't tell what it was. And I said, well, Lorraine had some good luck on that trip. She had a beautiful beaded bag Frank had given her. It cost $45. And you know, back in about 1923 or four, a $45 purse was a pretty fine purse. We uh, had stayed at a tourist court, they used to call nowadays their motels, but the tourist courts weren't as fine. They just didn't have this nice place for travelers. Anyway, we camped, and we had uh, cooked our breakfast and eaten it, and we had stopped in a restroom, and that's where her purse was. And we got out of town, oh, quite a ways before we thought about it. And when we went back, there it was hanging on the door. Uh, it must have been just what a sure thing, just nobody came in there. We stayed at a hotel in uh, Eureka Springs. It was a hotel that was used as a girls' school in the winter. It, it was rather a fashionable place, but it, it just didn't compare with other places we'd been, so 
uh, we weren't too glad we went, except I did wa enjoy watching Marion. He loved nature. He loved pretty trees and flowers and the wild animals, and he just went into ecstasy every time a squirrel had run across his path or he'd see something of that sort, and I thought, well, it was a shame that a child that enjoyed things like that had to live out in a place that was as barren as Juana was. The same is true of books, too. He didn't have access to as many books as I wish he could have had, because, as I said before, Corner had no library. Of course, uh, after the radio came, he had access to good music. He loved radio. He made a set of some sort. He had what he called a camp, a little place enclosed on the back porch that he used to go in at night. Well, I think he slept back there sometimes. And he would get stations that were uh, far off. I wish I knew more about it and could tell about that. And he had records. We had an Edison phonograph, and some he had selected some of the records that he liked. And I always felt sorry for Papa about that phonograph when he bought it. He looked at it and he said, now I can have something, to, some music I'll have somebody to play for me and made me feel bad because he'd spent all that money on me and I never did learn to play to, well, I just disappointed them terribly. They never did say anything bad, I know, but I didn't get very far along in music. He did have advantage of travel. He had two trips to California before he was through high school. The one Mama took him when he was about six, and then later, I think he was maybe 15, Mama and Papa and Marion went out and stayed a month with Uncle Card in Los Angeles, and they certainly did see everything, and have a wonderful time, and they stopped at the Grand Canyon on the, the way back. And then it wasn't too long after that till Sue and Mary and I went to a dude ranch in Montana, and he got to go to Colorado several times. We went to Carlsbad Cavern and the cavern didn't have a elevator as it does now. It was a pretty hard job for us to go through. And they didn't have any place for us to eat. We had to take our lunch. That was for they got the restaurant. And I wished many times I could have waited to have gone after the elevator and the restaurant were there. But the cavern was so marvelous, it made up for all the inconvenience we had. Now, Pop wasn't feeling very well. and. He couldn't go through the um, canyon. He just went part of the way, but he had good company that day because there were other people in the same shape. And from there, we went on up to Colorado and had a nice little um, stay in just Colorado Springs. <laughs> He was 12 years old, I think, when he came to see me in Fort Worth. He just visited me one time that I remember. And there were a couple across, of men across the hall from me. One was a, a German. I was just saying that across the hall from me in this small apartment, where I lived the first year I was in Fort Worth, there were only four apartments, were two brothers. One of them looked like the German side of his house, and the other looked like the um, English side. And 
They were so much different than the looks at one time I heard somebody say, um, you don't mean to tell me that that uh, Englishman is that blankety-blank German's brother, do you? I was quite chagrined one day when I stepped out into the hall. These men lived right across the hall from me, and Marion was lying on the floor reading one of their books. He came down to visit me and stay with me till school was out. His school was out before mine was. And he was that way about books, and of course I was too, you know. I think I told you that the first sentence I ever said was, see the book, and I've been seeing it ever since. And Mary Ann is the same way. Well, I think we all were. But I'm glad we like to read. It's made an, all of us happier. And uh, Frank said that when he was overseas at World War I, when he was visiting in London and uh, Paris, he just saw so many things because he knew what to look for and could appreciate what he did see. And he said it was tragic and it bothered him no little that so many of the boys, in the American soldiers investing in those two cities, didn't go anywhere. They didn't know what to look for and didn't, when they saw things, they didn't, couldn't appreciate them. Frank and Papa had a nice trip to St. Louis. Of course, I think traveling goes a lot along with reading. It affects your life in just about the same way. Papa and uh, Frank went to St. Louis uh, when Frank was in his teens. I can't remember just how old he was. They got a free trip up there on a cattle train. They helped to feed the cattle on the way up. They slept in the caboose. And when they got to St. Louis, well, they went to a nice hotel and got a ticket, f free ticket back home for the work they did coming up. Papa had worked on a cattle drive in his youth. He went from Fort Worth, rode a horse, helped drive the cattle, from Fort Worth to the uh, stockyards in uh, Kansas City. And now we don't have any stockyards. It was quite an adventure for, for to drive up there. You hear quite a bit about it, about the Chisholm Trail, but I believe that he was not on that. Anyway, he said at night they would uh, sleep on pallets on the ground, and they'd coil their lariats or the ropes around their beds because the snakes wouldn't crawl over the ropes. And one night he said that uh, they heard a cry. They don't know whether it was a mountain lion or maybe just a wildcat. But anyway, it was a pretty bad cry, and one cowboy thought it was a child crying, and he th they had to restrain him to keep him from going out to uh, see what was the matter. Going back to our not having any uh, stockyards here, stockyards made in North Fort Worth, and for the, over for years that that was the leading industry, and now the stockyards are closed. Of course, now the bomber plant is the um, the big industry, and the stockyards didn't employ as many men as the bomber plant, but it did make North Fort Worth, and I don't mean a suburb called that, I mean just the northern part of the Fort Worth, the part where I taught 37 years, well, 38 years counting the first year in the MGL school. The uh, st stockyards are picturesque old part of town. Their buildings are still out there, and there's been a, been a fine restaurant put in one, and it has a historic marker on it, and people sometimes go out there to see it. There are several good places out there to eat. A, a part of that stock show was uh, uh, the pageant, that was the beginning of it, and it was a very spectacular thing. They had a queen, and oh, there was a lot of money spent on the costumes and the parades. Then the uh, horse shows were good, too. Lula Long from Kansas City used to bring her string of horses, and she nearly always won the prize, and there was a rodeo with 
roping and throwing and other radio shunts, including clowns. And when I lived in Fort Worth in Corona and was teaching at Acme and uh, in Corona, I very often would come down to the stock show weekends. It was held in the spring then. Now the stockyard show is a big thing yet, but there's several buildings out uh, by the uh, Will Rogers Coliseum where the stock shows held. There's one building for sheep and one for cows and I guess one for horses and pigs and it's quite a big thing. And there's always some kind of a show in the auditorium out there at that time, but I don't think it's as pretty and spectacular as the Oval Stock Show before they moved it out to the on the south side. And in a way, they, they killed that part of town when the move was made. There have been many, many changes in Fort Worth since I came here, but of course, that's been over 50 years ago. And any place that's grown certainly changed in that length of time. There were less than 100,000 people here when I came, and now there are over 400,000. The uh, industries in, around Fort Worth and Dallas probably uh, uh, almost make the towns and cities join, and it's said to be the heaviest industrialized part of the South. Thinking about changes, I have thought so many times about the first time I saw Manny. We were riding one day and we crossed a railroad track and he said, when I get big, I'm going to be a train driver. We'd been talking about Chicago. I don't know how that subject came up, but anyway, I said, well, Manny, are you going to drive from here to Chicago? He said, no, I'm going to drive to Africa. Well, I didn't tell the child that he couldn't drive to Africa because maybe he will. The wonderful things that have happened in the, in my years. I had not got used to the miracle, it seems to me, to punch a button and get a light in a room until the other changes came so fast that I couldn't keep up with them. A little television, for instance. And when Marion was a baby, just big enough sitting in his hot chair and he hadn't even started talking, he discovered the moon. We were eating supper one night and the shade was up and he looked up and saw the moon and he became ecstatic. ecstatic. He lifted up his little arms and he tried to reach the moon. And I have wondered so many times about what a wonderful thing it was that he lived to see a man on the moon. Of course, if I had told him that that might happen when he was a little thing, well, everybody would have thought I was crazy. Well, nobody thought of that. Nobody ever thought back in that day that anybody would go to the moon or Mars either. Now, this has nothing to do with the change in Fort Worth, but was one excitement that I had the first year I was here. I was out at the uh, Forest Park Zoo, which at that time was a very small zoo. And I, Kathleen Bradley and Mrs. Uh, Bradley from Odessa was with me. And as we were walking along, we stopped at a bear cage. Well, the, it had a, had a kind of a little house and the bears were inside there. And of course, there was a card on the fence telling what they were, and we didn't see any bears. But we heard a groan, and we saw blood running from this little house out to the, almost to the sidewalk. And Kathleen said, uh, well, I know what that is. She said, uh, that, that, there's a baby bear being born. Well, of course, we know that in yeah, in uh, the woods, in natural, st natural state, the bears are born in hibernation. And I have read that the mother didn't know anything about it. She'd wake up and find a cub or maybe more cubs, and that'd be the first time she knew it. It didn't bother her a bit. And they just didn't wake up till it, it was time to take them out into the world. But this bear knew it. Because we could tell from the 
agonized cry. And in a minute, the father ran out with the baby in his mouth. In his mouth, it looked like a drowned rat. It was not, oh, it wasn't any size at all. The mother followed, and she was growling at him. And they growled at each other. And they turned around. They didn't stay out, but just a minute, went back inside this little tiny house that they came from. I say tiny, it's compared it is compared to what to uh, where a bear would be natural in that wasn't in captivity. I read in the next day in the Fort Westchester telegram that there were two of those uh, little bears born, those, and they both died. And I've often wondered if maybe that father didn't kill those bears. Anyway, it was about a year or two ago. There were two other cubs born out there, and the paper said that the they were the first ones that were born there, and that they died. Well, I didn't answer the paper, but I knew that they were not the first ones born there because I had seen one of the first ones that was born there. And the reason I say that, the zoo wasn't old enough for much to have happened before at that time. It was the zoo was quite new. Annabelle and David's son, Bill, was born in 1927. And David, his little brother, was up at Quorma. Of course, I wasn't there, but they told me about it. They called David and told him he had a little brother, and he was quite delighted. He, when he got home, he was <laughs> quite disappointed. He knew that he was going to have this little brother. His mother had talked to him about it, but he'd got it into his head his little brother would come big enough for him to play with. And when he saw just a tiny baby, why well, his feathers fell. Marion had to graduate from high school and started to rise. Rice was a wonderful experience for him. He loved the place very, very much. He was a little bit rebellious when he got down there. He said uh, that it made him mad when he saw the difference in the preparation that he had had for college uh, and the, the difference in what he knew and to boys, because then there were just boys, boys from better schools. He did well the first year he was down there because their standards are very high. It was a hard school to get in, and it's a hard school to get in yet, and it's hard to stay there. He was afraid he wouldn't meet the, their qualifications, their standards. So he worked hard, and he came out all right. And after a little while, he thought he was maybe working too hard, so he quit. And his grades came back, he just barely was passing. I said that year that Marion was one of the best, and well, the whole thing, through the whole schooling, five years he was down there, he was one of the best dancers and tennis players, that, the golf player too, that Ross turned out. And he did so extremely well in high school. I was distressed over this. And I said, Marion, what made you do so poorly in Ross? You just barely got to stay there. He said, well, it was because when he was in high school, he was f far ahead of most of the class, and he didn't like to be different from the others, and he didn't intend to ever be called Dictionary Smith anymore. But there came a time when he didn't have anything else to do, and he went back over all that uh, work that he had, those his books, and he went back and reviewed and worked hard on all those things he just barely had passed in. Um, he was uh, good enough that the University of Colorado offered him a job when he was working on his master's degree. Our boys all worked in the fields when they were in high school and uh, the, summer, the summer after, went before they had regular jobs. They chop cotton mostly, and if you're not a Southern, you may not know what chop cotton means. It means you chop the weeds out of the rows. 
David came home one night, just tired, he was dead, and he said, well, every day he just said to himself that uh, if he could live till sundown, well, he believed he could live till morning. I'm not sure that Marion shop cotton, but I do remember that he worked in the uh, wheat field with the th help with the thrashing, and we'd go out and get him once in a while through the week and bring him in so he could have a bath and something to eat. Now, he had plenty to eat out at the harvest field. They, they feed the hands well, but it wasn't what he wanted. He wanted ripe olives and pineapple and things that they didn't have to eat. <laughs> The first Christmas Marion was in Rice, it was a very cold Christmas and he didn't figure on that. <laughs> he came uh, up on the train from Houston and he had very light clothing. The, it must have been warm down there, but by the time we got out of town, out of Fort Worth, I met him at the station and the train was late. It threw us to go home at night, which we hadn't figured on. It was pretty cold, and I guess I didn't have a heater in that car. That was the first car that belonged to me. The other cars I had driven at home had been family cars. And I didn't take the trouble to go to a filling station and see about the gasoline. I just guessed that I had enough gasoline, and I didn't. Manabel and David lived at Electra then. That's uh, just a very short distance from Wichita Falls. And I believe I made a mistake. I believe they were living in Electra when Billy was born. Anyway, we were trying to get to Electra to spend the rest of the night, and we didn't make it. It stopped out there so cold, it was just terrible. And we went to sleep let a bus go by that we could have hailed and ridden on into Wichita for, to an electro. Finally, two men came along, and they had two cars. They were towing one car, and they were riding in the other. I don't know why they had two cars, but I know what they were, why they were there. One of them worked for um, the, uh, Magnolia Oil Company, and the other one was his uncle, and I guess he just hitched his car on and came for company. Anyway, the one who worked for the oil company was on his way up to a lecture to check a man out, and I told him that uh, I just believe my tank wasn't full. Of, uh, when it was filled, it wasn't filled right, because I always had been able to make that uh, trip on uh, that amount of gasoline, and he said, well, he helped me out. He said, uh, to Marion, you get in the car with the uncle, and they dr drive, and he'd get in there with me, and he'd get us on into Electra. <laughs> I was amused at him. He called me honey, and I talked to him a while. I told him I talked in Fort Worth, and after a minute, he said, I want to apologize to you for calling you honey. <laughs> I said, well, now, that didn't make any difference. I just suppose you were like my landlord. But I thought you just uh, called everybody, honey. And then he asked me if he could take a drink. And I said, well, of course, now, it was his car. But I said, if you are sure it won't do anything to uh, make you turn us over. He said, it won't. So he took his drink. He was so cold, I felt sorry for him. He didn't have a heater either. And finally, we got to Wichita Falls about 3 o'clock in the morning. Manabel, of course, was worried sick. She just knew something awful had happened. And she had some soup on the stove. She turned on the burner and heated that. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, we had hot soup. And that was the best soup I ever tasted. Decided I'd like to go to... Uh, Dude Ranch that summer, and so Mary Ann was going to go with me. He'd do, he'd do the driving, 
And just before we left, Cousin Gus and Cousin Molly and their children came up to see us. And Sue had just graduated from high school, so Cousin Gus decided that as a graduation gift to Sue, he'd send her on this trip with us. Well, Sue was a sweet, cute thing and lots of fun, and of course we were glad to have her. She was about two years younger than Mary, and we went first to Colorado, and we stopped there, and uh, saw some of the sights, and then we went on up to Cheyenne, and at Cheyenne, we visited one of our former neighbors, uh, Alma Bradley, her name was then. She was sister along the woman, to the woman who uh, was with me the first when I saw the baby bear. We had quite a good time in Cheyenne. I had visited in Laramie, but I hadn't been to Cheyenne. And it was, it was rather an interesting place. And of course it was summer, but it was began to get kind of cold up there, and I worried about Mary, and I couldn't make him take a wrap at all when left home. He wasn't cold in Quantum. He wasn't going to take one to Yellowstone Park, any wraps to Yellowstone Park. But Oma lent him a sweater, a, de a pretty red sweater. If she hadn't, why, well, I had to bought him a coat. We got on, to, went to Cody, Wyoming, and came pretty near pulling off the same stunt I did the night that we got so cold coming up to Electra. We just barely had enough gasoline to get to, to Cody, and it was certainly did look good when we got there. We spent the night, and we went on to the OTO. That was the, the brand of this range. Uh, an O and then a T that was taller and another O just the same size as the first one. It was a dude ranch and we certainly did have good time. Sue did have a marvelous time because it was the first trip she'd ever taken. There was a log ranch house. Now they didn't have cows, they just had horses because they were in the entertaining business. That, and then there were uh, some log cabins out in the yard. Some people stayed in the house, but we stayed in a cabin, and Marion slept in a tent. I know people at the eating breakfast would laugh at him because he came in later morning, and they said he always came from his tent to the dining room singing, combing his hair, they, and they could see him through the window as he came along. We rode horseback all through that part of the country, it seemed to me, because I hadn't ridden in a long time. I never was an expert horsewoman anyway. I, the horses I'd ridden had been buggy horses, and so they gave me a mount that wasn't any ways dangerous, and I was glad of that because I had had one experience that frightened me at home. I was riding Cricket, that was David's pretty little horse, and rode about seven miles out in the country. I was just out riding by myself. And I turned around to go home, and Cricket decided she'd go faster than I wanted to, and she just plain ran away. My hat came off, my hair came down, and I quit trying to stop her. All I did was to hold on till I got there. But I didn't have any horse like that to ride at this ranch. They didn't use horses that were very lively because most of the people there never had been on a horse before in their lives. I learned something about a horse going down a mountain. Some of the times we'd go up steep places we couldn't ride down. And a horse is the best thing in the world to get you down a mountain. You lead the horse. And the horse has, uh, well, his four feet are just four brakes. He just comes down the safest way in the world, and you go the same gate as the horse, and you get down the mountain without much trouble. After uh, we were at the ranch a week, that was the time we'd planned to stay. We met some very interesting Eastern people, and we had had, had 
grass to eat. It wasn't season to kill it, but it was far out in the country. This son-in-law, the ranch owner, thought nobody would catch him, so he shot the grass anyway. And sometimes we'd play cards and sometimes we'd dance, and it, it was quite a, quite a nice excursion. We went on into uh, Yellowstone Park and went through the park. We stayed at the uh, lodges, not at the hotels, because the hotels cost too much for us. The last place we went was Roosevelt Lodge, and it was off kind of by itself. It was a dude ranch, too, and not too many people went there. There, the bears came up to the back door there to get the garbage from that ranch house. They, and throughout the park, the garbage was hauled to the feeding ground to the bears, but this being a small place didn't have a feeding ground. And there was a bear there with two about half-grown cubs. She'd bring them up. They had uh, barbed wire over the screen of the kitchen door so the bears wouldn't claw a hole in the wire, try, in the, the screen trying to get into the house. There was a ranger there, and I went out to see the mother and the cubs. And he said, now, whatever you do, do not go between her and her cubs. Said, she's really a wild animal, and these are her first cubs, and she's very, very, very nervous about them, and don't you dare go between them. Well, I walked behind her, and that was just as bad. I didn't know that, never thought about that. So she turned on me. And she caught her teeth in my sweater. I guess that's all kept me from getting bear bitten. The ranger took a stick and drove her off, and I went back in the house. We went from the park to Salt Lake City and had a good visit there. And we didn't go swimming in the lake, but we saw it. We saw the temple and uh, the tabernacle, because we couldn't go in the temple because we weren't normals. And our experience on the way home was not too good. Near Thistle, Utah, we had a wreck. Now, we were on the Pikes Peak Highway, they called it, and they called it Ocean to Ocean Highway. But it was not a highway. It was simply a road. And the place that our accident happened was not wide enough for two cars to pass. Marianne saw the a car was coming, and he headed into the side of the hill to give the man what room he could. But the man hit the back of our car anyhow and knocked him down the hill until he uh, well, there's a mountain, really till his car caught on a tree. Now, he didn't try to get out. He needed enough, enough to keep still, and the people who did come to help us said that uh, if there'd been a, another body and in, in somebody else in the car, the weight of the two would have been so much that it would have pulled the uh, his car off the tree, and he really would have been in trouble. He'd just gone on down the mountain till maybe it would have killed him. We didn't have any trouble getting help. Somebody came in a hurry. Now, we were near this thistle. Now, thistle wasn't big enough to even have a name. There was a very small restaurant there, and there was a garage, and uh, just a very few houses. The only reason there was anything there was because um, of getting the train up the mountain, there was a r sort of a roundhouse place where they kept engines anyway, and they kept extra engine there to push the train up the mountain, and then the, uh, that engine just come on back and go into the, the roundhouse. That's all its work was. So, of course, there was no accommodation for us, and our car was banged up. Somebody told us that uh, we could sleep in a house there that was vacant. It was, a, I guess, it had been a, a farmhouse because it was uh, hay all over the floor. Now, we had some cots, 
we were prepared for emergencies like that. We had some cots and some cover. So we put our three cots out in, over that hay and the, night, the uh, rats ran over it in the night and it wasn't much of a place to sleep. I thought about it so many times after I went to, to uh, oh, see some of those fine European hotels that, that I had been from the sublime to the ridiculous in the accommodations where I'd slept in the course of my travels. And the worst thing about it was they told us that uh, somebody would probably pick our car in the night and they said, uh, now don't do anything about it. Said that if anybody comes, they'll probably have a gun and we'll give this boy Marion.